Honeymooners, wife abducted, never found. There was a shocking believe it or not story that came from the well-known author of six popular bear attack books up in Anchorage, Alaska. Teacher, wildlife author, Larry Caniot. It was a second-hand story about a honeymooning couple from Nome, Alaska, whose bush plane ended up grounded by dangerous weather deep in the Alaskan wilderness on an unnamed lake. In the course of making camp for the night, it was thought that the young bride wandered off to gather firewood and was abducted by what the witness perceived was a large Sasquatch. Apparently, the young bride called out. The groom gave chase, but couldn't catch up. He returned to the tied-up Cessna 180 to quickly retrieve his rifle and continue the hunt, but the trail was lost, probably due to the foul weather that grounded them initially. Kenyatt was unable to verify that story for research, but it bears notice since Alaska law enforcement in Nome was allegedly involved in the search for the abducted woman. No sign of her was ever found. Sportsman Goes Missing The Bella Coola Courier carried a story concerning the unexpected disappearance of a retired British Army sportsman known to the locals as Colonel Robert F. Linzel. The article dated Saturday, April 11, 1914, stated that Colonel Linzel was an ardent fisherman and sportsman, familiar with the wilds of Bella Coola. Linzel left for a day's fishing as he usually did near his residence and was never seen again. Constable Broughton searched but found no trace of the colonel and finally engaged the Indian trackers to hunt with canoes. Linzel was traced to the river's edge where his fishing gear was found. It was assumed that he fell in the river and drowned, an odd and most unlikely thing to have happened for a veteran woodsman of Linzel's caliber. His cache of fish and his lunch were missing. Another Bella Coola account, though second-hand, was gleaned from my box of post-it notes. I wrote the notes down during a conversation with the late René de Hinden, dated November 1998. It was in regard to de Hinden's talks with bear hunter and guide Clayton Mack. Mack, a proud First Nation Nuxalt, apparently told de Hinden that a woman went missing from his village in Bella Coola when he was a young man. The First Nation woman went to gather berries. Her basket was found, but nothing else. The woman's adult son went looking for her after the local search failed. Renee told me the son was never seen again either. I regret not recording that conversation, for I neglected to cite the date of those disappearances or Renee's source but the story. Little Known Kidnapping A tale of kidnapping not often written about was recorded by David Brewster in Our Last Monster, Seattle Magazine, August 1970, on pages 29 to 33. It should be a classic, because it's far more interesting than the dramatic stories of Albert Osman or Mouchalot Harry sagas. Borrowing from Brewster's work Probably the most detailed Sasquatch adventure on record is that of Albert Osman, a recluse who went gold prospecting 100 miles north of Vancouver in 1925. One night, while laying in his sleeping bag, he was picked up by a Sasquatch and transported to the creature's lair in a box canyon. Much of Osman's story details his Crusoe-like concern with mustering up a good cup of coffee in the mornings, but he also paused to admire the very practical and warm blanket which the Sasquatch had made of cedar bark and moss, and to play some games with the two shy children. The old lady, he recalls, wore bangs and needed a brazier. The story ends when Osman cut short his courtship with the daughter of the family, reasoning that she would hate city life as he does, and tricked the old man into swallowing an overdose of snuff. Then he flew the coop as the father, squealing like a pig, downed a pot of coffee, grounds and all. A similar story comes from Warren Scott, a 37-year-old Seattle man who works as a building superintendent. It was June of 1961, and Scott, who grew up in a tough neighborhood in New York City, and spent several years bumming around after his release from the army. He was camping alone, 30 miles northeast of Vancouver. Late at night, a Sasquatch kidnapped him and carried him 70 miles. During the journey, Scott was almost suffocated by the creature's vice-like grip and uremic odor. Eventually, he was carried through a long tunnel and dumped in a cave. Most of Scott's ordeal was spent in this hot, firelit enclosure. The mother took care of him, bringing him food, grains and inedible chunks of raw meat. The old man was seldom around. I was treated like a pet, Scott recalls. 
He endured some good-natured whacking on the rump. He was watched intently when passing wastes, and he engaged in some rock rolling with the kids. The noise and the smell were terrific. At night, father, mother, and son Sasquatch would hold each other tightly, rock for ten minutes, and then drop off to sleep on bow beds. One day, Scott wandered out of the momentarily unguarded cave and was terrified to see fifty or sixty Sasquatch wandering about in the canyon. The female who fed me came up to me, grabbed me, and held me to her bosom until I was calm. Then she put me down. Soon thereafter, Scott's protector took him, together with her son, on a tour of the other caves, one of which proved to be a very busy nursery. A few days later, Scott located the densely curtained tunnel opening and made his escape. There was a plethora of Sasquatch behaviors listed in David Brewster's narrative. Not only was another kidnapping listed that was little known in research, but the behavior of making a blanket of moss and cedar bark proved interesting. Brewster goes on to describe the Sasquatch's vice-like grip, the foods brought to the captive man, and sleeping arrangements. It is the second time I've read testimony regarding how the Sasquatch hold close a human who is out of control until they become calm. It was hard for me to imagine being calm, being held in a vice grip against the chest of a Sasquatch, but I guess it happens. Interesting, too, was the description of the horrific noise and smell of the cave. I imagined the awful odor of a porta potty on a hot day and found the remarks about the smell the most believable part of Warren Scott's story. But Scott, or anyone, being treated like a captive pet was a new one on me, and a thought I hadn't considered. All in all, there was a great deal of clues to Bigfoot behavior and other conducts in the article. Continuing on, David Brewster wrote, I was pleased to discover a collection of robust stories collected by a Fairbanks, Alaska contractor named Fred Clark. For 12 years, Clark, who is 50 and the father of four, has been collecting Sasquatch tales, mostly en route between Alaska and California. You can pick up hundreds of these stories on such a drive, says Clark, who seems to find thriving oral traditions at every remote town. For instance, when he rushed off to check out the Grays Harbor County story, an old woman at a service station told him that the local Sasquatch has been breaking pigs' backs for years. Another woman topped that story with one about the day her husband, while he was out cutting wood in shakes, was slammed into the mud by a Sasquatch. It's fair to say that one never knows the mindset of the Sasquatch on any given day. It's wise not to test them because brute force and survival skills are all they seem to know. They cannot read your intent. Clark's stories about the Sasquatch portray them as a sort of gypsy, as well they might be, but I think once they find a safe place to live and raise their family, they stick to that one region. One Indian name for the hair-covered giant, according to Clark, was Wanderer, one who loves to take long walks. When they visit one another, the main activity of the men is combing each other's long hair, which falls to the shoulders and is colored black, brown, shades of red, camel, or off-white. Sasquatch observed eating live squirrels. I can't remember when I wasn't fascinated by field reports, Early in the 1990s, I was sent one of the old ISC journals that the late Richard Greenwell published. Great journals they were. Many old-timers out west will remember wildlife biologist for the Oregon Department of Fish and Game fieldman James A. Jim Hukin. In one of those issues of the ISC journal, Hukin documented a few of his field trips, and I uploaded them to the website, probably in 1996. Concerned with whatever happened to Hukin, I asked Joe Bielert if he heard how Jim was doing. Apparently, Hukin is enjoying retirement from field work and still living in Oregon. Those of us who were around back in the day will remember Hukin's field work with Jack Sullivan and on occasion Rip Little. DeHinden spoke highly of both men, and that's saying something. DeHinden's penchant for belittling men he didn't like was well known. A veteran 20-year Sasquatch field man, Hukin had a story or two to tell. Hukin uncovered evidence that the Sasquatch rummaged around like bears, tearing up logs and stumps looking for grubs and rolling over stones and rocks. Hukin went on to say it was quite difficult to decipher whether such evidence was bear or Sasquatch activity, because they don't leave much sign. If there were claw marks, it was probably the work of a bear. 
but if there were no discernible sign, then it was probably a Sasquatch that ripped bark off trees, etc. Jim Hukin. Sniffing Behavior One of Jim Hukin's interesting stories. Hukin showed a photograph of a rock quarry-like pit shot high in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. A logger by the name of Glenn Thomas told Hukin that he observed two Sasquatch squatting around a giant rock slide of big boulders in a field dotted with old-growth pines. He watched as the male picked up boulders and one by one sniffed and smelled them and moved on. The sniffing behavior continued until the larger of the two Sasquatch found the right smell. At that point, the creatures started digging through the stones until they found what they were looking for, a pocket full of hibernating ground squirrels. The witness told Hukin that the creatures did not see him until they came up out of the giant hole they dug to sniff out the squirrels. He said the Sasquatch were very agile. There were three of them, a male, a female, and an infant. He went on to say they ate those squirrels right there on the spot, raw. Keith Foster story. Foster is an avid bow hunter and one of our early investigators covering Bigfoot events in Colorado and Kansas contributed this story to my files back in May of 2001. It concerned the Taos Indian history of killing cannibal giants with bow and arrow. Traditionally described by the Taos Indian Nation from the Four Corners area of Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, and Colorado as giant men with hair covering the whole body, with big hands, feet, huge muscled arms, big head, and big mouth, they were much feared. The Native American Taos people believed that these beings were a dangerous type of humans who lived wild in the forests and would sometimes come and kill members of their people and take them to high mountain caves and eat them, all according to Taos Indian history. Traditionally, Native American and First Nation history was recorded by elders of a tribe and then handed down generation by generation through centuries of spoken teachings. They did not write their experiences. One story in my files told of finding caves where the giant hair men lived. In these cave-like dwellings, the Taos warriors found bones scattered all around of the ill-fated victims. The bones may have been animal bones, but to the fear-filled Indian, they believed them to be the bones of ancestors eaten by the dreaded men of the mountains. From that terror-filled experience, the ancient Taos tried to kill a family of the cannibal giants by setting fire to sizable stack piles of brush crammed into the cave entrance. As smoke filled the caves, the Taos would take aim, shooting at the cannibal giants with their bow and arrow as the creatures, great in size, emerged from the burning barricade, choking and coughing. Attempts of this sort were not always successful. Often, choking-haired ones exited the cave wounded or on fire, so the narrative went. These events were supposed to have occurred about 800 years ago. A similar bit of folklore was told to me by members of other tribes, all with similar altercations with the hair people. History reflects great wars among Indian nations and as well between Indian and giants, especially when women were kidnapped and held in caves as wives. Old Story Wounded Bigfoot Vermont hunters circa 1879 described a Bigfoot-like being as a five-foot-tall creature. It resembled a man in physical appearance, but was covered all over with bright red hair and had a long straggly beard with wild-looking eyes. The Vermont hunter mistook the wild man for a bear and fired on the creature, believing strongly that he had wounded it. The thing responded with fierce cries of pain and rage, and then it turned on the hunting party, driving them away in terror. The party lost their guns and ammunition and dared not return for fear of encountering the strange being again. Ron Schaffner